Good morning, everyone. Um, before we begin, can anyone open us in prayer, please? Jesus, we thank you for this um, day that you've blessed us with. And Lord, we thank you for this time that we can come together uh, to learn about um, um, the people who stood, uh, stood up for uh, their faith and who lived your gospel and who um, whom you used mightily for your kingdom, Father. So I pray that we would uh, be inspired as we hear the stories and that... Um, and that uh, thank you, Jesus, that you're continue, uh, continuing to minister to us and that we'll have a good time together. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Um, so we'll just continue from where we stopped yesterday. Uh, yes, yeah, so yesterday we just started to look at um, now church growth in our present day as one of the main ways that uh, God is continuing to move within the church, uh, specifically through mega churches. And we looked at one of them, which is the uh, one in South Korea, so um, Yoida Full Gospel Church. Uh, so that church uh, is now maybe not the largest, but at one point was the largest church um, and continues to be one of the top three largest churches in the world. Um, we move from there to uh, this is, so I'm taking this from our notes because the, our book was written in 2015. And uh, this church, the International Charismatic Mission Bogota, Colombia, was one of the largest churches at that time. And it no longer is, but uh, since it's in our notes, I included it. So. Um, the church grew from about eight people to over 200,000 people. That is at the time uh, at around 2015. And um, it's yeah one of the largest churches in the world. There's another church in Colombia um, in the same city of Bogota, uh, which is the place of his presence, it's called. And that's also one of the largest churches in the world uh, at present. Um, did we look at this the revival in Argentina yesterday? No. Okay. So, uh, 1992, um, there was a pastor named Claudio Friedzen, um, and he was pastor of a church called Buenos Aires uh, in Argentina. And he began to seek the Lord personally, so for himself, uh, seeking the Holy Spirit. And uh, as he was seeking the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit touched him powerfully. And through that touch of the Holy Spirit, his ministry changed dramatically. Um, so from there, uh, he began to preach and teach in the church on the Holy Spirit. And there was a renewed hunger for God, a uh, new emphasis or a desire for personal holiness, for prayer. Uh, to see the Holy Spirit move uh, in power in their midst as they gathered as a church. Um, so this is a quote from him about that time. He says, pastors were seeking methods for church growth, but methods were not the answer. Uh, and his advice was, there is no method. We must seek the presence of God. My message is simple. I'm emphasizing the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so that was the key to the growth of their church and the move uh, of the Holy Spirit among them was rather than seeking methods or seeking ways to reach people that were human uh, methods or ways of uh, doing that, uh, he sought the Holy Spirit himself. Uh, and that was key. Um, so 1992, also uh, in the US, uh, there was a man named Rod, Rodney Howard Brown. Uh, so he was from South Africa. He was an evangelist. And he moved in 1987 to the US. Um, in 1989, he uh, was preaching at Clifton Park, New York. Um, and during that time, there was 
signs, wonders, miracles that were displayed through that time. People were saved, healed, delivered. They encountered the presence of God. And uh, also, um, soon after that, around 1992, uh, there was also breaking of laughter within that move. So uh, people would start laughing in the Holy Spirit. And so it's called the Laughing Revival. Uh, in 1993, uh, he met with Randy Clark, who was a vineyard pastor. So Randy Clark had been praying and hungering for more of the Holy Spirit. And so he came to meet Rodney Howard uh, and asked him to pray over him for more of the Holy Spirit. And so he prayed over him uh, five times in that meeting. And from there, Randy Clark went back to his church. And uh, there was a supernatural outpouring on the vineyard church because of this uh, encounter with Rodney Howard. Um, so the uh, Vineyard Church then started to see a move of the Holy Spirit in their services and also in their pastors' meetings. Uh, we'll see how that spread from the US within the Vineyard Church to Canada. So, um, so Pastor Ka John and Carol Arnett were pastors of the Vineyard Church in Toronto, Canada. And uh, they had been praying for a move of God. They were hungering for God to move. And uh, as they saw and heard about revivals in different places, they would travel to those places to see what God was doing there and to experience that. Um, in 1993, they met Claudio Friedzen. So we just talked about him in the revival in Argentina. Uh, so they met with him and he prayed of, over them and they received a powerful impartation, but they still want to see more happening in their meetings. So for them personally, they experienced the Holy Spirit, but they felt that uh, God wanted to do something in the meetings itself to be impacting people. Uh, and so they, in 94, they hosted a four day conference with Randy Clark. So Randy Clark was the one who um, was prayed over by Rodney Howard. And um, during that time, Randy Clark shared his own experience of what he'd experienced in the through revival uh, and then invited people to come to the altar asking if they would like to receive it. Um, so 120 people had attended that. And as he shared his testimony, people started to come. But before they could even come to the altar, some people were falling down uh, wherever they were seated, just falling down in the presence of the Lord and were not able to get up. Uh, there was shaking, trembling, uh, laughing, crying, speaking in tongues. So it was something that was not very, that was not what people were expecting. It was a little unusual for them. Uh, but in the midst of that, there was emotional and physical healing and deliverance that was happening. And so that was evidence that this was really God moving uh, in that time. Uh, so by the end of 1995, uh, 600,000 people from almost every nation in the world had visited Toronto because of this revival. Uh, and in that one year, there were 900 first-time converts, uh, people who came to faith. And um, lots of churches were also impacted through this revival. So uh, there's, it's listed here, Holy Trinity Brompton Church in the UK, Bethel Church in Reading, California, and Heidi and Roland Baker of Iris Ministries. So through this revival, all of these ministries were impacted. So what we're seeing today in these churches can be uh, kind of uh, tracked back to the Toronto revival. Uh, 95 to 2000, uh, we look at the Pensacola revival. Uh, this happened in a place called uh, the Brownsville Assembly of God. Um, and um, there was a speaker from London. Uh, his name was Stephen Hill. And so he was sharing his experience of how he had seen God move in uh, revival in a church in England. Um, so what had happened was there's a pastor's wife from this church in England, which was the London Vineyard Church. She went to Toronto uh, and after visiting Toronto, went back to her church, uh, which was an Anglican church. Uh, so the Anglican church was a little more traditional um, 
definitely not very charismatic. But she visited that uh, Toronto revival, went back to a church, shared the testimony, and God started to move powerfully in that church and from that church into other churches. Um, and so this uh, evangelist, Stephen Hill, had visited that church. And the pastor there prayed for him. And he then experienced revival. So now he went to this other church in Pensacola, and he's sharing his experience, and revival starts to break out there in that church. Um, so revival services began there and continued for five years. Uh, there were 300, uh, 3 million people from around the world who visited um, who visited this revival because they wanted to see what God was doing. Um, there was strong preaching, there was repentance, there was conviction of sin, there was uh, renewal spiritually among the people asking more of uh, asking for more of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and from here, the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry also started and sent uh, 120 uh, sent graduates to 122 nations. So it they uh, not only like spread revival as they were sending people out, uh, but they were also equipping people through the school of ministry and then impacting nations. Um, so what led to this revival was that two years earlier, the pastor had been praying, had started praying for revival. So we see that as a throughout these revival stories, right? That someone has been praying and then revival breaks out. It's never that no one was looking for revival, no one was desiring it, and it just came. Uh, it's always there is a hunger, there is a thirst, and God uh, answers or God comes in response to that. Uh, but one uh, sad thing within this church was that uh, they started to become, there was some uh, problems in the leadership, and finally that church itself, people started to leave the church. Um, so that work didn't continue with the same power, but uh, still some church historians call this the most significant church-based renewal of the 20th century because of the impact that it had. Next, we come to India, 2006-2007. Um, okay, I think the... This thing slide went off. One minute, sorry. So, uh, 2006, 2007, I'm not sure how many of you heard about the Shillong revival. Did any of y'all know? Okay. Uh, so, um, this, the revival that we read about, the Welsh revival, which happened in 1906, had actually reached uh, Shillong in 1906. So when it was coming to 100 years after that, that revival, they wanted to do a celebration within the church. And so two years before the revival celebration, that 100 years was going to be celebrated, they started to pray for God to move again in the same way. Uh, that was within the Presbyterian Church. And so when, during this celebration in April 2006, during that 100-year celebration, uh, there were 150,000 people gathered at the Presbyterian Church. Uh, and uh, God suddenly moved. People came. Uh, people felt very convicted of uh, their sins, there was miraculous conversions. People actually stayed in that service and continued to sing for hours. Even though it was raining, they were in that service. Um, from that time, uh, there were many uh, there were many deliverances that happened among alcoholics. There was restoration of broken families. Uh, there were children who saw visions of angels, of heaven and hell. Um, Within, uh, within school, classes would be disrupted because children would just start to break out in prayer and start to sing. Uh, so the regular classes were not continuing. And uh, within the Presbyterian Church, there's a Malki Presbyterian Church, there was a cross uh, that was hung there. And that cross started to glow um, and continued to glow for a few days. So that was some of the things that happened in this revival. I actually visited Shillong that year. Um, in December, 
and visited this church by the time the cross had stopped glowing, but we saw the church <laughs> at that time and heard from a lot of children who had had visions uh, and seen angels and all of that. So it was quite... There was just a light that came from behind. The Yeah, so there was a light that came on that cross and nobody knew what that was. Like, there was no explanation of why that light was there. And it was just glowing like that for a few days. Um, so there are like physical things like that that have happened that people don't know how to explain. Um, but this was one of those things. I think I'm sure there are online. Uh, yeah. Other things. It was just a wooden cross that was in the front of the church, but uh, from that cross there was a light that was. Um, okay, so um, yeah, from there we moved to Calvary Temple, which is another very large church, so one of the mega churches and one of the top three mega churches in the world uh, and it's in hyderabad india uh, so it started in 2005 uh, by um, pastor satish kumar he started it with 25 people uh, and today it has over 3000 members within the church uh, the emphasis within the church is on preaching and teaching god's word and they've used a lot of television and that has helped with their growth so um, within um, within Hyderabad and outside within the state, I think, or even outside, television has been made a huge impact and helped the ministry grow. So we actually have come to the end uh, of this full church history of revivals uh, from act still present day. Uh, we'll just look at what are some things we are seeing in the present day moves of God and what are some key things we've seen in these revivals as we've looked at all of these revivals. What are some things that we've seen uh, happen in most or all of the revivals and things that we can take away from it. Um, so in present day, uh, what we're seeing emphasized within the church is God's manifest presence uh, and his glory within the church. Um, so rather than seeing signs, wonders, rather than seeing healings, all of those things, which we still um, want to see and we're still pursuing, uh, we are also, there is a greater emphasis on becoming people who carry God's presence uh, and people who take his presence into wherever we go. So whatever spheres that we are influencing and impacting to be carriers of his presence into those places. Um, so rather than uh, seeing God come, like the Holy Spirit fall and move within us as a visitation or an outpouring, uh, it is for us to become a place, so a uh, people who carry the presence of God, a habitation of God. Uh, like how we see in the Old Testament where God's presence descended on the temple, right? So to be those kinds of people who are carrying his presence in that kind of power. Um, so it that means uh, we have to be people who are prepared to carry his presence in that way, uh, to be spiritually hungering and thirsting for his presence, um, to be allowing him to move in our lives, to uh, purify us, to refine us, to uh, fully allow him to have that place in our lives. Uh, so a lot of this has come from what has happened in the past. Like right? We talked about this. 
Uh, we looked at these revivals because we want to build on what has happened in the past. We want to draw from past experiences within the church. And we want to take all of that and go higher and deeper and further in our uh, experience of God's presence. Uh, so that is the whole intent of looking at all of these revivals. Um, so some of the ministries that are emphasizing this, the presence and glory of God, um, is the Bishop Bill Hammond, so uh, Christian uh, ChristianInternational.com, Rodney Howard Brown, Revival.com, John and Carol Arnett, CatchTheFire.com, Randy Clark, globalawakening.com, Bill Johnson, Bethel.com, and Heidi Baker, Iris Global. So um, all of these ministries, if you notice what they are emphasizing, what they are seeing in their ministries, it's all of this. Uh, so carrying the presence of God and manifesting his glory in our midst. We look at key observations from all of these revivals. Um, the first one is uh, the connection between reformation, revival, restoration, missions, and church growth. So we saw that in Acts, we saw the Holy Spirit moving in power. We saw uh, how the church was experiencing the Holy Spirit in their midst. Uh, and then we saw how... Uh, the church slowly lost out on all of that, and we went into the dark ages. So what uh, brought the church back into this period of revivals was the Reformation. Uh, so the Reformation, by Reformation, we mean a discovery of what is God's truth, and then aligning ourselves to God's truth. Uh, so that is key before we can then move into revival. Uh, so to first understand what is the truth that God wants the church to be walking in and then to align ourselves to it and then we start to experience god's presence and god's working when we are walking in his truth um and so the revival is seeing god's presence seeing god's move in our midst restoration is the church growing into new levels uh of god's uh, glory so recognizing more of God's glory, experiencing more of God's glory, and the church being prepared. So uh, the pouring out of new wine, right? So the church itself, the ch culture within the church changing uh, so that we have we are prepared to receive the new things that God wants to give us. Um, and then from there, we see church growth. So it's as the church is being restored, as the church is changing um, and becoming that new wineskin that we then are able to send people out on missions to reach other people and to see the church growth. So to impact um, the communities we are in and to impact the nations. Mm -hmm. The next thing is that there have been seasons of global revival. So. Um, Here's a list of all of these times when God was moving in multiple places around the world. So revival uh, doesn't necessarily have to happen in one place at one time. It usually spreads. And uh, there are times when God actually moves almost all around the world because revival sparks in all of these places, either starting in one place and spreading to other places or happening almost simultaneously in several places, like the Reformation, actually. Um, so um, what do we see that helps this revival spread is that the stories, as people hear about these revivals in other places, they start praying for it, they start seeking it, uh, and then God uh, brings revival to those places. Um, we also see that uh it is an opportunity for us as we see something happening in another place to then start to seek it for ourselves so we don't want to copy methods or we try to follow exactly what they're doing or duplicate what they're doing but we seek what is god revealing in that time through that revival what is being accomplished spiritually uh, how is he uh, growing that church and then we desire that for our church. And we start to seek that for our own church so that we are in tune with what God is doing globally. And we are ready to receive it at the time that he uh, chooses to come to our locations, to our churches. 
Um, so some of those global revivals is the first Great Awakening, 1725 to 1750. Uh, we saw that in North America, Scotland, England, Germany, so parts of Europe and North America. Uh, 1780 to 1810, uh, the second Great Awakening, which began in England and then spread to North America, South Africa, Europe, and other parts of the world. Uh, 1830 to 1840, the general or third awakening um, that again was in North America and Europe. Uh, 1857 to 1858, the Layman's Prayer Revival, which started in New York and then went into Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, England, Jamaica, and South Africa. And then 1900 to 1910, the Pentecostal Revival, uh, which has happened across like uh, all parts of the world, almost on every continent. Um, so yeah, those are examples of global revivals. Um, another thing is that those who were impacted by revivals became carriers of revival. So in some cases, we see that a church experienced revival and then sent people out uh, to go and tell others about revival. So we see that um, examples from the Asbury revival, uh, from the revival in Topeka, Kansas, the Bible college there, where they went out and started to teach whatever they had experienced, they started to take that into churches and that spread the revival. On the other hand, we see people who go and seek revival for themselves and then take it back to their places. So like Randy Clark from the Vineyard Church went to receive prayer, um, like uh, the uh, the Toronto Vineyard Church as well, the pastors from there went to seek prayer. Uh, so they were visiting different places, trying to experience God in those places so that they could see it in their churches. So those are some ways in which revival spreads through people. Um, another thing is focused, intentional pursuit of God often paves the way for revival. So. Uh, we see throughout these revivals that somebody was praying, whether it is two people or four people or the church as a whole or just the pastor. Uh, somebody had been praying and had been committed to prayer for revival, not just praying every now and then, but there we see where time was committed to revivals, right? Like um, where they were praying from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. Um, days a week uh, for a few months before uh, God answers that. So seeing that kind of prayer, um, the um, uh, the revival with, um, what is their names? The Hearn Hut community. So they're 100 years of 24 hours of prayer. Uh, it's that kind of commitment to seeking the Lord in prayer and hungering and thirsting after God and inviting him uh, to come into our communities, that brings revival. Um, and then sharing revival stories often ignites revival. So where um, you share of something that's happening in another place, you may not have gone there and experienced it, but you were, you've heard of the stories, sharing those stories uh, sparks revival or sparks a desire for revival and then uh, people begin to pray for it. Um, so we have a quote from J. Edwin Orr here. There have been instances in the history of the church when the telling and retelling of wonderful works of God have been used to rekindle the expectations of the faithful intercessors and prepare the way for another awakening. So it's when we tell these stories, people start to desire it, people start to expect it for themselves and are inspired to seek God uh, to move in their own churches, in their own places. Uh, and so that's why it's important to be looking at these stories, like what we've done through the last few weeks, uh, to look at all of these stories so that our hearts come to a place of expectation for God to move uh, in our midst as well. OK, so we'll um, just look at Reformation, uh, some of the reformers and the Reformation, what we learn from them and what we can take back for ourselves for the present day church. Um, so the few reformers that we looked at were John Wycliffe, John Huss, 
Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, George Fox. So this is on pages 34 to 39 in your textbook, um, where we talked about the Reformation and all of these people. Um, so Reformation is the act of removing things that are problematic within the church, correcting things that are wrong in the church, and uh, coming to a place of uh, rightness with God, rightness with what God wants. Uh, so an act of improving, an act of uh, correcting ourselves and aligning ourselves to what is true. Uh, and so that all of these people that we looked at, the reformers, they paved the way for revivals to start within the church. Uh, it was as the church made came back to what is true, what is right, uh, that revivals began to be seen within the church. Uh, and through those revivals, then there is restoration within the church, and there is the move of missions and church growth. So some of the characteristics of these reformers is that they themselves had a deep relationship with God. Um, so that is a key, right, for us to be personally walking with God, uh, to have a revelation of who God is, so that we are then able to stand strong in the face of uh, the challenges that will come up when we are calling the church to do something that maybe nobody wants to hear. Uh, we should be able to be able to stand for that. And how we can stand for that is our relationship with God, our revelation of this I know is what God has revealed to me is true, and I can stand for it. Um, they had, yeah, so the next thing, they had the strength to stand alone. So even when most of the church was against them, uh, when it was just one of them or few of them, they were so strong in what they believed, what uh, God had showed them, that they were unwavering, even in spite of being alone in those uh, challenges. Uh, they had the courage to speak even though they were facing religious, social, political systems, right? So they were speaking against those systems of that day that were so powerful uh, and would definitely result in their death, right? So uh, all of these people, uh, or most of them, were martyred for what they had uh, said, right? What they had called the church to. Uh, so they had the courage to speak even though that would be the end. They knew that uh, death would be the end. They knew that they were going against the powerful people of their day. They weren't afraid to do that. Um, they were willing to lay down their lives for the truth they believed. Um, and whenever possible, so they used uh, different tools and platforms to proclaim their message. So they uh, at this time, because it was mostly limited to writing, they used writing, they used preaching to let other people know the truth. So uh, not to just keep that to themselves or to fight for it for themselves, but to spread that teaching, spread that truth as far as they could, even if they themselves would not be physically alive to continue to speak it their written works continue to impact the church even after their death. And so um, that is some things that we can learn from these reformers. So we'll close with this slide. Um, we need reformers today. OK, apart from what I've mentioned here, why do you all think we need reformers within the church? apart from what's mentioned on the slide. Any thoughts on, do we need reformers and why? <laughs> First of all, because uh, Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the church should be prepared, right? To be that bride um, of Christ, yeah. Uh, and also, like, um, it's actually getting harder to win people. Mm -hmm. because the world is getting more uh, influential and mm -hmm. uh, so it's harder to draw people and so we have to try to reach out as much as we can mm -hmm. and be creative in a way that we try to yeah. bring them in yeah and if you look at these revivals it was really the holy spirit who was drawing people right 
like what we read uh, about uh, one of these revivals, he said the people were choosing methods, were looking for those kinds of things, uh, programs, methods to reach people. But uh, I. I've chosen the Holy Spirit, like I've sought after the Holy Spirit. And so that is key because when people see the Holy Spirit moving, the Holy Spirit himself will draw them. Um, and yeah, that's so important. Any other thoughts? My online students as well. Okay, we'll uh, just go through this content then. Um, why we need reformers today? We need people who are unafraid to address things that are hindering the church. So uh, oftentimes uh, we have things within the church uh, that keep us from moving forward, that keep us from experiencing God in new ways. Um, it may be just traditions that have become a part of the church, maybe things that have been uh, held on to for so long that it's very difficult to hear uh, that this is wrong or this is something we will no longer practice. Um, but to have people who can stand up and say, um, this is wrong, even if you're saying it to the whole church, to the church worldwide or to your local church, uh, to be that bold, to say it. Um, to, uh, we need people who will proclaim the truth, so uh, who will say what is right and be willing to challenge what has been accepted as this is the way we do things, right? So be willing to challenge that. Uh, reformers help us see things that have blinded us as a church. So um, we may not be able to see truth because we've only known this this one way of doing things or this one uh, one thing that was taught to us and we're not able to see uh, beyond that so they help bring truth help us open our eyes to what is true um, they help us break past limitations so um, so we see that uh, even with the like the stopping of seeing the Holy Spirit move in the church, right? That was something that was a limitation that was put upon people. They didn't think that we could see the Holy Spirit move in that way anymore. Uh, but it is because uh, the reformers called people back to the study of the word uh, and said that the word itself is the authority for the church. It is not. Uh, it's not the church leaders, not the popes, not the priests. Uh, it is the word. And so that's what took people back to the word, to look at what is the what does uh, the Bible teach and what should we be experiencing in our church according to the Bible. Uh, and that's what opened people up to seeing the Holy Spirit move within the church. Um, and the last is help us deal with things that we have accepted as the norm. So those things uh, may be the things that are holding us back from moving uh, with God into the next level of seeing God do more in our midst and uh, ushering us into greater levels of revelation of who he is, of greater experiences of his presence in our midst. Uh, so uh, the reformers help us uh, to recognize those things and then to deal with them, to take them out of our midst so that they no longer are hindrances. Um, so, yeah, we pray that each of us would be people who kind of take this for ourselves personally as a challenge uh, to become people like this, right? To be people who speak the truth without fear, who are able to call people to God's ways even if it means we're challenging authorities uh, to be people who uh, are so in tune with God's truth, so in line with who God is, uh, that we are able to say whatever we have to say with boldness, with confidence, uh, in knowing that what we're saying is 
revealed by God. Um, and then to be able to invite other people into that truth, to experience it for themselves. Um, so we'll close here. We'll continue next week. I need to take a look at um, your next few assignments. So I'll try and look at that and post things during the week, because we have, I think, a little over a month for the rest of the semester. So I'll uh, just look out on Google Classroom for any notifications. Uh, I'll also take a look at how much more, how we are doing in our progress on course content. And then uh, if needed, I'll try and post a video as well uh, to cover some of our content. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. So I had actually uh, put four assignments for this semester. Um, and we've only done one so far. So I'll post maybe two. And then the last one will be a quiz, which I'll do at the end of the semester. Um, so uh, it's not going to be, it's going to be like a paper, reflection paper. Yeah, both are papers. OK, the quiz will be uh, multiple choice, yeah. OK, thank you all. See you next week.